I hope you had a great conference so far. Um, for me, I have to say it's great to be back on a real stage, on a real conference in front of real people. And I would like to start my talk with a huge round of applause for all the organizers, because it's the last talk of the day. Just a huge round of, of applause for all the organizers, because it's a great venue. We had great food, although I didn't eat too much because I was just too nervous. But it was everything was so great organized. So just one great round of applause, please. <clears throat> yeah, I do have some problems with the microphone. Okay. So, um, my name is Nico. I'm a freelance front-end developer from Bern. I'm currently working um, for the Bern Cantonal Bank on the e-banking front-end. I'm also one third of uh, Say Hello, a very small digital agency in the, um, in the Bernis Oberland in Spiez. And I am also um, part of the Google Developer Experts program for web technologies, which basically only means that I just spend way too much of my free time playing around with all the new um, browser APIs and all the web uh, capabilities. Yeah, and today I'm here to take you through my journey with the Web Bluetooth API. Although I shouldn't call it a journey, because um, a journey somehow has a defined starting point and a defined end point, for me that whole process was more of an uncontrolled falling down the rabbit hole, but I will get to that later. And, um, well, browsers have, built around this, have been built around this idea that you would have, or they would request data from a server, and they would then render that data. So browsers have always been great at communicating with uh, servers that might be hundreds of kilometers away, but it has always been quite challenging to interact with devices that were right next to that browser. Now, um, I mean, it is possible. You can spin up a local server, you can connect to that server using the, uh, a local network, but then you lose all the benefits that you have with the modern uh, web APIs and um, <coughs> that require, some of them require HTTPS, uh, and it's basically almost impossible to um, guide users, end users, to use your device, device that they just bought to connect that to somehow local host, well, uh, I don't know. So, in the last years, we have seen a couple of APIs with the project Fugu and the whole movement of progressive web apps. We have seen APIs like uh, Web USB, Web NFC, um, Web HID, and also Web Bluetooth, and they all try to fill this gap. Let's have some basics first. Uh, Bluetooth is a wireless technology standard to exchange data that uses the same frequency as wireless LAN. But it was designed uh, to, to send very small bits of data over a short distance. And if you now think of this old, buggy, and frustrating experience you had with your first smartphones, or no, <laughs> your first cell phones, I need to say, uh, I, have, I have some very good news for you, because that was the old Bluetooth, the Bluetooth Classic. Right now, we have Bluetooth 4.0. And with that, we have Bluetooth Low Energy, BLE, also referred to as um, uh, Bluetooth Smart. And that's a completely new standard that was uh, designed especially for IoT devices, so it's very energy efficient. And it also runs over a long distance, so up to 100 meters, and with Bluetooth 5.0, even more than 100 meters. Also, with uh, Web Bluetooth, we are always talking about BLE because that's the standard that was implemented in uh, the web platform. So the way Bluetooth works is mostly like this. You would have um, a central device, a very capable device in terms of CPU and in terms of, um, of, of battery usage. And then you would have peripheral devices, devices that you can connect to it. And we also refer to them as the client as the central device and the peripheral device um, as the server. So it, now it's very important to mention that you can connect one central device to multiple peripheral devices, but you can't connect one uh, peripheral device to multiple central devices. That's why, for example, you can connect your uh, smartphone to your smartwatch and your headphones at the same time, but you can't connect your headphones to two smartphones at the same time. That's just how the standard um, 
uh, the standard was built, and also to peripheral devices, they can't directly communicate with each other. They could do that using the client device as a relay, but not directly. So um, as part of BLE, the Bluetooth Special Interest Group, in, uh, group introduced a concept called the Generic Attribute Profile. And that's basically the way how a, um, a peripheral device would expose data to the client. So the peripheral device would um, uh, provide a GATT server, and that server basically contains a list of GATT services. Each service is then a group of characteristics, and now one GATT characteristic identifies a value, and it also defines what operations can be performed on that value. For example, if you take um, uh, the battery level, we have the battery service and we also have the battery level characteristic. Now, um, it does make sense that a client device can read the current battery level. It also makes sense that you can be notified, so the, the, the peripheral device will notify the client um, when something changes, when the, uh, the, 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 the battery level changes. But it doesn't make sense to make that writable because you can't just overwrite the battery level and then expect the, the battery to be, to, to be magically at 100%. That just doesn't work in electronics or in batteries. Um, but if you have the flight direction of a drone, for example, there it is crucial that you can write the characteristic, that you can overwrite the characteristic. Now one GATT value is then just a very, very low level data structure, so it's basically just an array of bytes. And there on the right side, um, that's how I, or on the left side, I don't know, um, <laughs> that's how I imagine it for myself, that's just a JSON, where the server is the, the, the JSON file, and then you would have the, um, the first level as the server, the second level as the, the characteristic, and then you would have the, the value as this array of bytes. That's how it could be implemented in a light bulb. So you would have a uh, service like the device information service, the battery service, and the light service. Then you would have characteristics um, for all of those services. And now it's very, very important that that is very, that's for us as humans. We want to read what the service, what's the name of the service and the, and the characteristic. But for uh, computers, names, strings are not the best way to represent something. So that's why we have UUIDs. Now, as you can see here, we have short 16-bit UUIDs and we have long 128-bit UUIDs. Now, the 16-bit UUIDs, the short ones, they are reserved for so-called standard services and standard characteristics. So that's basically a list of services and use cases maintained by the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. Um, and if you have one of those use cases, you should use one of those UUIDs. Now, if you have your own hardware, or you are a manufacturer of your own of, of hardware, then you very likely will have some use cases that are not in that list. So therefore, you should use 128-bit UUIDs. You could write your custom use case, your custom characteristic, and you should use the long UUIDs. But that's not a technical requirement. That's just a recommendation. Um, and we will also later on, we will see examples where they did use short UUIDs for custom services and custom characteristics. <coughs> so let's have a look at one example. Right here I am using uh, or I'm using this this play bulb sphere here and I'm using an app called NRF Connect for Android. It's an app that allows us to um, to to scan for all the available BLE devices and now we see the whole list of all the devices around us. We are now interested in the play bulb sphere so we can now connect to the playbub sphere and we will receive a list of all the services. Now you see there are uh, standard services like the battery service that has a battery characteristic and also NRF Connect knows the names because it's a standard characteristic and a standard service. And we can now read the value which is around 60% which is enough for our use case. And we also have this custom services for example, the FF0F, or FFDF, and there we have a whole list of, of, of um, custom characteristics. And I have no idea what all of those do, but I do know there's one characteristic, the FFFC, 
which has four bytes, FF, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And I can now overwrite that value. <clears throat> Let's try, for example, FF, oh, sorry, 0, 0, FF, 0, 0, 0, 0, and the light bulb will turn red. OK, that's cool. Just let's try another one. 0, 0, 0, 0, FF, 0, 0, and the light bulb turns green. Here we go. Let's try one last value. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, FF, and it turns blue. So what you see here is, on our play bulb sphere, we have those four values. And we can think of it like we would have um, four LEDs inside the play bulb. We have a white LED, red LED, green LED, and a blue LED. And now with the value of the byte, we can now change the intensity of each of those colors. And what we know from, the, from, from computer science and the RGB color space, we can basically create any color with the mixture of R, G, and B values. <coughs> so. Let's go over to the Web Bluetooth API, to the um, browser API. First of all, on the Navigator, um, we have the new Bluetooth object with the request device method. That method ac accepts um, an, an object with those two parameters. We have a filter and we have optional services. The services are basically a list of, um, of services that we will need or that we will use later on, while the filter is an array of all the filters that our device has to match. Now, when this code runs, the user will see this prompt where he can now select and pair one of the devices um, that matches the filters. And once it's selected, we will receive the device. And on the device, we can call device.gatt.connect, and we will get the server. Now, with that server, we want to read and write values. First of all, let's have a look at the battery service. Um, on the server, we will call get primary service using the UUID of the battery service. We will receive the uh, service. On the service, we will then uh, uh, get the uh, characteristic. And now, on the characteristic, we um, can now basically just call characteristic.readValue, which will then read the value. I really like when web APIs do what you expect them to do, because that's not always the case. But in our case, we will receive a data view, so just an array of bytes. And for the battery level, <coughs> we, now want to, um, uh, we now want to get the, the, the first byte as an integer. And that's just our battery level in percentage, so between 0 and 100. Now, the battery characteristic also allows the notify operation. So we, we can add the, uh, event uh, the event listener characteristic value changed, and that will be fired whenever the, the um, battery level changes on the device. Now, in, for the sake of energy efficiency, those events are not sent by default, so we also need to call characteristic.start notifications, and then the device will um, send those events. <coughs> Now, um, to write a value, let's take the um, light characteristic and the light service. We will get the service, we will get the characteristic. Now you see on the play bulb sphere, they did use 16 bit UIDs. As I said, that is possible, but not recommended. They did it anyway. And now we will read the value as before. And we are interested in the second, the third, and the fourth value, which are the RGB values. And we will then return those, um, those values. To write a value, we can then call characteristic.write value without response. There's also the write value with response, but that's just um, a matter of how it's implemented on the device. So in our case, we have um, a write value without response, and we can then pass a new data view, and we will update the characteristic on our device. So now, um, Let's have a look at the demo, because I want to make sure, or want to prove that I'm not just making something up. My slides are actually um, uh, running in the browser. So what I can do is I can just open the console, and then here we go. And those are exactly the commands that you have seen before. We will first 
um, get the device, I need to connect to the device. Once I have the device, I can connect to the server. On the server, I can connect to the light service. On the service, I can select the characteristic. And now, the moment of truth, when I run this code, I expect the light bulb to turn. Someone knows it? Blue, yeah, exactly. So, here we go. So that's my browser that sends Bluetooth commands to the play bulb, to the light bulb, to turn, to change the characteristic and to turn the, um, or to change the light. Let's try another one. Let's add some green to that and it will turn. Okay, maybe I should add some more green to make it more clear. Here we go. Nice little uh, turkeys somewhat. Okay. So, with the Web Bluetooth API, we now have the possibility to control any BLE device that we have around us. But there's one problem. Reverse engineering BLE devices is a huge pain. Before I found the play bulbs here, I bought a couple of, of different uh, BLE light bulbs. And the thing is that all of those light bulbs, as I've said, I mean, there is no, no standard service or standard characteristic for light. So each of the manufacturer, they implemented it in their own way. And none of them had any um, documentation. So um, I tried a couple of them. I tried to make sense of the, the, those service UUIDs, of those characteristic values, and so on and so forth. I just wasted a huge amount of time, time and energy. And I also did know that there is a whole new world right outside the window. There is the world of Arduinos, the world of Raspberry Pis, the world of Picos, the world of hardware. So I thought, I should just go on an adventure. And the adventure turned out to be a bit of a rabbit hole. <coughs> but um, so what I did is, first of all, I bought a little plastic buzzer. The buzzer has a little closing contact. And I also did buy an Arduino RP2040. That's the, I think it's the newest Arduino board, which also has a Bluetooth chip um, on the board. And I connected that Arduino to the closing contact. I also added a little LED to just to have some indicator what's going on. And the, the, the GATT server I have on the Arduino has basically just one service, one characteristic, one byte. And that byte could either be zero, which it is right now, or it could be 255, so FF. And I also allowed the notify operation. So um, my web application, my slides, they are now connected to the server. They are listening to the characteristic value change event. And whenever I click on the buzzer, it will change the value, and I will just um, uh, show the next slide. Now, there's one big difference between that one and a normal clicker. A, um, a normal clicker that does use Bluetooth, they don't use like bare Bluetooth they register their device as a so-called human device, uh, sorry, human interface device, HID device. So HID devices are devices that are like mice or like keyboards that they try to, to standardize on top of USB and on top of Bluetooth, they try to standardize input devices. My buzzer here uses BLE directly on the web application. And as I said, when I click it, I will just Show the next one. Oh, one uh, important thing, my slides will be online right after the talk, and you will have all the, the links to all the um, GitHub repositories and all the demos um, there as well. Next up, <coughs> I have this little LED matrix. Um, that's a Raspberry Pi COW on top of a little battery packet a package, and on the top here I have this LED matrix, that's 7 times 17 little LEDs, and the Node.js application I have on my Raspberry Pi can control each LED. So what I have in the end is 119 LEDs, and then whenever I want to write a word or do anything, I will just um, change the, 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 um, 
the intensity of one of those LEDs or of a couple of those LEDs, and I can uh, just write hey or something like that. Now, I did want to um, connect that with a web application, so I wrote a um, GATT server, so a BLE server. And what I did here is each of the LEDs got a number, and my GTT value was one or is 119 bytes long. So whenever I want to light up one of those little LEDs, I just need to change the value of the byte. So the word hey would basically mean that I would just um, update the, the, the value of the, what is it, 20, uh, of the LED number 21, 23, 25, and so on and so forth. So that's basically the whole, um, the whole concept I'm using here. I did create a demo application. Here we go. And can I can now connect to the scroll hat matrix. That's the name of the device here. And I also have, hope you see it, I have a little stage here with a camera. Now oh, I can. Here we go. I hope it's enough, but um let's just try it out. So whenever I click on one of the um one of the of the of the uh, dots, it will just um overwrite the characteristic and it will write the new value and it will light up the LEDs. Problem here is I mean I have how many? One hundred and nineteen little pixel. How much fun can you have with one hundred and nineteen pixel? Turns out my first uh, my first cell phone was a Nokia uh, 3310, I guess, which had a couple of more pixels, but I was able to play games, and I was able to spend hours playing some games, especially Snake. So what I did is I created Snake in the browser as a JavaScript application, and I'm using my little um, LED matrix as the, the uh, play field, and whenever my, um, the status of the game updates, I will just update the characteristic, I will write a new characteristic on the matrix, and you should now be able to start the game. Here you go. Yes. And so on and so forth. So as you see, it is possible to have a lot of fun with some hardware devices and um, Bluetooth. Next up, um, next up, I well, basically that was the the, the first the initial idea I had is I wanted to create a car. So what I built is a little car called Speed Wheels and. Speed wheels, uh, it's actually not that fast, but my son came up with the name, so I am perfectly fine with it. Speed wheels is a um, Raspberry Pi, uh, sorry, an Arduino Nano RP40. It was a Raspberry Pi, my first iteration of the, of the car. But I, well, <laughs> I was tired of always booting the whole microcomputer while everything I wanted to do is to just move some wheels, so that's why I changed it all to an Arduino. Um, the problem with the Arduino is that um, my C++ knowledge is like that, and my ideas are big, way bigger. So what I did is I tried to, to um, keep the, the device part as small as possible and to move all the heavy logic to the browser. I also I then um, uh, bought some raw Lego bricks to build a nice little uh, case. And I'm using a lot of glue just to keep it everything together and to not break it when I'm traveling with it. And yeah, it does break sometimes. So um, what I have is my little C++ program, which has basically one function. The function accepts two values, one for the left wheel, a wheel between minus 100, full speed backwards, and plus 100, which would be full speed forward and some logic for the little LED, uh, sorry, the uh, RGB LEDs circle. And the question I had to answer is, how should I structure my characteristic? So, I am a front-end developer. I have basically two rules. 
First of all, I don't care about payload sizes lower than kilobytes. Second, um, whenever two parties would communicate with each other, I would just use JSON. So that's what I did. <coughs> I would have the object with the left and the right value. I would stringify that. I would convert the string to a data view. So we have those, I don't know, 20, 25 um, bytes. That's perfectly fine for me. And so now maybe some of you have more experience with hardware development and low-level data structures, and you think, what the hell were I thinking? And you are perfectly right, and I'm very happy that I found it out myself. I mean, I, I do have two values between in the range of minus 100 to 100, or also in the range between um, uh, uh, 0 to 200. And that's perfectly in the range of one byte. And here we go. Uh, second iteration, I would just um, use two bytes, one for the left, one for the right wheel. And it's funny because it actually makes a huge difference whether you have 20 or two bytes, especially if you have a low, um, a low bandwidth connection like Bluetooth and you want to send a lot of commands really quick, it does make a difference. And I found that out with the Matrix, for example. The Matrix, the, the, the snake game, does not work with a smartphone because somehow it works with the laptop, but it's just too slow to, to send those 200 or no, 120 bytes um, all couple of milliseconds. But um, here we go. Um, <coughs> that's the moment of truth, whether it will work or not. Huh. Okay, it does not. Ah, here we go. <laughs> So you see the little uh, red, uh, sorry, the little blue dot. That means it is now looking for an, for a um, connection, I, uh, and I have the demo application here. The cool thing is, it is a web application. So a web application is cross-platform by default. <coughs> so what I did is I can now use it with my smartphone. So um, that's exactly the same application that I have on the uh, on the uh, on the desktop as well. I can connect two speed wheels, and now it does work. Let's quickly move it here. So I can go backward. I, I can go forward. It doesn't like the different. I can make turns sometimes. <laughs> but in the end, I mean, I have arrow controls, and that's quite boring. And <laughs> I, I do have the whole, the whole power of the web application or of, of the web platform right here on inside the browser. So what I did is I, for example, tried to use the gyroscope of my smartphone to, um, first of all, to transfer the, the, um, the position of the smartphone into uh, a, a changing characteristic, and that characteristic should then move the car. Ah. Here we go. So, yep, it did work. But I didn't want to stop there. Because um, did you know that you can use machine learning on the, on the browser? Yes, you can. For example, you can um, analyze a given uh, video input stream and then analyze, for example, hand gestures. And now I will just open it up. Here we go. Maybe it needs some time, but ah. nah. <laughs> okay, maybe one wheel stopped working, ah. but it does work. I mean, we can use TensorFlow to um, 
to uh, analyze hand gestures to convert them into uh, um, to convert them basically into wheel movements at the end. So um, here we are. One thing, one problematic thing is browser support right now. Um, I don't think it's a big surprise that uh, Microsoft and Google are pushing the new technology, while others are waiting for a more established state of the of the specification. <coughs> it was already implemented in 2017 in Chromium. Since then, um, there is a lot of discussion going on, whether um <coughs> or a lot of concerns, I should say, because if you can connect hardware devices directly to the web platform, there are a lot of potential risks. And for example, Apple, they decided, or WebKit, they decided that they will not implement web Bluetooth, web USB, web HID, and all of those um, APIs because they have concern about the fingerprintability, and as long as the other vendors didn't solve those problems, they will not consider that API. And that is a especially a big problem because um, on the desktop we do have alternatives on iOS on the on the on smart or on um, iPhones there is a thing called the webkit constraint so each um, browser on iOS needs to use webkit under the hood so even if you have um, Chrome on iOS it still uses webkit so basically Apple decides what features will be used um, on the web platform and which um, can't be used uh, on, on, on iOS. But there are solutions. <coughs> For example, if you are like me and you only want to play around with a couple of APIs, there is an, um, an, an iOS application called WebBLE that allows you to use Web Bluetooth um, on iOS. Now, if you have uh, a, a device that you want to ship to customers and you still want to use the web platform, you could also think about uh, creating a cross-platform uh, solution. There's, for example, the capacitor plugin for BLE that um, is compliant with the spec with uh, Web Bluetooth. Um, so you could ship like the, the web application for desktop and for um, Android users, and you could you um, ship a native or a wrapped web application um, over the um, over the App Store for Apple users. And last but not least, there is hope. There is a project called the Open Web Advocacy, and uh, funny enough, they just three hours ago they released a new website, and that's basically a group of people that fight for true, um, a truly open web across all platforms. And there's a lot of movement going on in the regulations. If you go on Twitter under the hashtag Apple Browser Ban, you will see um, a couple of things are, that are happening right now. Uh, for example, the EU, EU is discussing that um, Apple should be forced to um, allow different browser engines on, on iOS. <clears throat> so maybe uh, in the future we will have a truly open web also on iOS. Now there's another very cool um, project I would like to show you. That's an application that is already in use since over three years. It's an internal application from the Murkoff Werkstätten in uh, Frauenfeld. And what you see in the, the middle is this little trolley. And there on the bottom, maybe you don't see it right now because of the light, but there is a little gray box. And in that gray box, they have a, a, um, a uh, um, power bank and a little uh, ESP32 with a Bluetooth strip. And this ESP32 is connected to three of those little buttons. And th those buttons can be lighted up using the ring on the outside, but you can also give feedback using the click on the button. Now, the application works in a way that the employee would um, open the application, he would see a new order, he would the, take the trolley, go to the shelf where the items are stored, they would then see, okay, I need on uh, shelf number two, uh, maybe, um, I need to um, place the item. Once they place the item, they can click on the button. Oh, the, the button is lighted up when they need to put it there in that exact position. And once, it's, um, when, once they click it, the application knows that they need to go to the next step. And that's using Web Bluetooth. So it's always, uh, first of all, it's the, the, the web application that gives feedback to which button should be lighted up. And also the, the, um, the web application receives then the confirmation using um, Web Bluetooth. 
<clears throat> and what I really like about this solution is that you don't need to have a super complex, over-engineered um, web application or software that um, only you and a couple of 10x developers can, can control. That's a quite an old application, and I think they still use jQuery in some parts, but they are still able to use those new web features, the new web platform features, to solve their problem very efficiently. And that's what I personally like about the web platform. So, to sum it all up, we have this very powerful new set of APIs, Bluetooth and also USB and so on and so forth. And we can now connect all of those um, to the whole potential of the web platform. And the question I ask myself is, how far can we go with that? Um, I, in the beginning, I said that we can connect multiple peripheral devices with one central device. But can we also connect multiple peripheral devices to one web application? If so, how many? Are there any limits? I didn't find any limits so far. And what I did is I created a little performance where I'm using the Web Audio API to listen for a audio input, to analyze the audio input. And during the analyzation process, I tried to send commands to all the different um, Bluetooth devices. Um, so I would have the play bulb. I would have my car. I have two of those LED matrices, but problem here is that one of those doesn't work right now, and I have no idea why. So we'll just need to um, do it with one LED matrix. But now I, um, <laughs> here we go. I would like to go through um, a little bit back in time to have some nostalgic, nostalgic, nostalgic feelings. Here we go. And. <laughs> So it did work. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. That was it from my side. Uh, I have one uh, sentence left. If you have ever been interested or if you um, ever wanted to dip your toes into this whole world of hardware development, of Arduino, of Raspberry Pis, and so on and so forth, especially if you are a web developer, if you are a front end developer, it's now the perfect time to do so. My slides are there under that, uh, on the with the QR code, you can receive the, uh, get the slides. And well, I think we do have time for some questions. Five minutes, perfect. So um, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, that's the thing with hardware. You always have some unexpected problems, and that's why I'm always super nervous when I have to, or when I um, have the possibility to show those demos. <laughs> Like, 
no, I can't. Um, or well, right now I, I I don't do anything, and I'm always a bit afraid that someone uh, tries to hijack one of the, of the stuff when I'm presenting. But um, the thing is, Bluetooth as a or BLE as a technology is open, so I have the I have the, the, the server, I can connect to the server, I can interact with the device or with the characteristics. As I've said before, some of the um, um, manufacturers, they try to, let's say, hide their characteristics, um, when here it's pretty obvious that you have those four bytes for the uh, white, red, green and blue values, but you could also have a couple of characteristics with a, some data like characteristic length and there would be super hard to find out which characteristic you need to change and what would happen on the uh, on the device. You could also encode some stuff. Um, uh, the, you could somehow encode the characteristics, so it's not that obvious. But from what I know, there is no built-in security. I mean, there, you could always find um, uh, ways to secure your communication by encrypting or not encrypting, but uh, uh, just change the way your characteristic works. But um, right now, I don't think that there's something built in in the standard. But I also need to say that I'm not 100% sure about that question or about that answer. No, we don't. Because, first of all, um, the, 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 the method you've seen to request a device, that needs to be a user gesture. So you can't just pop um, the, this thing up well when, the, um, when, when the app finished loading and trick someone. You can always trick someone if you have social engineering skills, but it needs to be um, a gesture that was initialized by the user. And then again, the user has to select a device and he has to pair to that device. So there are at least two steps, where, or three steps if you count the first click as well. So there are a couple of steps that the user has to do to connect to a device. And even if you did, or even if you went all the way, um, there's not that much you can do. I mean, yes, you can light up the, uh, the, the light bulb if it's on, that's creepy, but there are so many steps where the user has to do something that I don't think that you can just magically do something in the background. So, um, I mean, there are valid concerns, and it, that's why it's still in working draft state and it's not um, part of the of the web platform spec. Um, but uh, I think it's very unlikely. Okay, if there are no more questions, thanks again very much for your attention, for your time. It was great being here on stage speaking to you. And have a nice and safe way home. Thanks.